Father, we just thank you and praise you for who you are and what you have done so far. We don't take it for granted that you took time out to be with us this evening. We ask that the Holy Spirit reign, rule, and abide in this session tonight as we discover, as we discuss Matthew chapter 8, as we uh, learn more about Jesus' life through the Gospels, as we continue to forge forward uh, in gaining a greater understanding of your word and in, of your ways. And we thank you and we're ever so careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. Father, I ask that you think through my mind and you speak through my mouth, that you make those things that might be considered mysteries clear, that you might be edified, glorified, and magnified in our service tonight. We just thank you and praise you. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, praise the Lord. I pray that you can hear me uh, clearly uh, with no problems. Good evening. Good evening, each and every one of you. We are one body in Christ. Thank you for joining the Body of Christ Christian Ministries Life Enrichment Center as we endeavor to uh, discuss uh, the book of Matthew as we continue on this trek. Uh, my desire at one point was to try to get through all four Gospels by Easter Sunday, but I didn't realize that we would not get through the first Gospel by Easter Sunday. Um, so... Um, my prayer is that we just continue to do what God has led us to do and we will get to uh, what we need to get to on time. Uh, I look forward to um, spending some time with you on next Sunday um, talking about Jesus' story and uh, emphasizing some key points about uh, the resurrection, the sacrifice and what it means um, as we continue to go through the word of God. Um, remember, this is an open forum, so at any time you can unmute yourselves. Feel free to ask questions. Um, feel free to um, give insight and input. And uh, I will do all that I can to help bring clear understanding to the word uh, and to uh, make this an inviting session for you as we go through. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get started. Uh, we are in uh, Matthew chapter 18, and it starts this way. And I think I'm going to read, uh, this is, which words? This is the New Living Translation. Uh, so I'm going to read in the New Living Translation. It's just a slightly easier read, but I can always bounce back and forth between that and the King James when necessary. But it, it starts out this way. Um, the, the topic of the first section is the greatest in the kingdom, and it starts out this way. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called uh, a little child to him and put the child amongst them. Then he said, I'll tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like a little ch uh, like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these uh, little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have your large millstone tied about your neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptation is inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into internal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gorge it out and throw it away. It is better to enter life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. 
Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. Amen. So this first section really emphasizes a couple of points. I kind of want to go back to um, the question, which was, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus uses the example of a child. What do you think? Why do you think he uses the example of a child? I was thinking about the characteristics of a child as I pondered this question. Children are innocent. Children keep things simple. Children have some of the greatest faith that they demonstrate, especially when they're asking for things. They are relentless in their asking and they're relentless in their belief that you're going to do exactly what you say you're going to do. What's your thoughts about why he chose the example of a little child as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. want to share? I think it's uh, as both of uh, you and you, Bishop, and Pastor Truth um, have touched on, on that final point about them not having an agenda, right? That, <clears throat> that the innocence um, that they come to a situation or scenario with um, is, uh, you know, it's not them trying to be something or proclaim their rights or whatever the case may be. Um, and so uh, the perspective of the question, you know, who is grace in the kingdom, um, I think, it, you know, the reason that Jesus, as you both mentioned, reference children is because of that. Um, adults tend to have agendas, um, egos, a whole lot of baggage that we come into situations with and children are not like that. They come pretty open, pretty receptive. Um, so good points on, on, from both of you. Amen. Verse six picks up with this. It says, but if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. 
th- this really speaks to the the urgency and severity in which he looks at how we um, raise kids up, how how we share information, uh, because they're little sponges. They're going to absorb everything. And so he's telling us if we lead children astray, if we uh, cause them to fall into sin because we're not teaching them of him, then woe is us. And um, verse seven even says, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. And so it talks about the temptation to sin. Um, And so what do we do as adults that could possibly tempt children into behavior that would be considered sinful? I think the biggest the biggest thing uh, above anything else is the, the spirit of manipulation. Um, it's been around since the very beginning. That's how Adam and Eve fell because they were manipulated. They were tempted to manipulate it to do something they were told not to. And a lot of times um, because of peer pressure, because of uh, wanting to be accepted, uh, wanting to be liked and all of these things like that, we have a tendency a lot of times even um, – you know, the most innocent of us, we want to be accepted, we want to be a part of something and things like that. And so based upon that desire, people can manipulate others to do things at times um, that they, they, they really shouldn't be doing and that maybe they even heard that they shouldn't do. And so that causes people to stumble. God talks in many different places in, in the Word about becoming a stumbling block um, for, for one another. And he absolutely detests any kind of behavior that causes someone to fall. Uh, especially when it comes to the big life. Amen. Amen. Anything? Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, um, good point there, uh, Pastor Truth. Uh, the, what, what first came to mind when you asked the question um, was this, if we are not setting a good example, the first thing you'll see is our actions. Um, we'll have words as parents we say you know do what I say and then sometimes it's followed with the complete opposite you know not as I do Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think one of the things as well um, I I love that point about manipulation I didn't even think about that that's true that that was that was our point Um, you know if we if we're not setting a good example Right, we lead them astray because the first thing that they see is, oh, you know, mom is doing this, daddy's doing that, and I'm gonna follow suit. So if I'm walking in darkness, right, um, that's why children are usually covered by the parent, and the parents walk where they are spiritually, right? So if I'm walking in darkness, my child oftentimes will be in darkness as well. I like the point that you made, Pastor Mike. I like the point that you made about an example. Because unlike Adam and Eve, children, when they're born, don't have a sense of right or wrong. They haven't been told or taught anything up to this point. Everything that they learn comes from us. And so when he talks about um, leading children into temptation, that puts the onus on us to watch the type of witness that we are providing and what type of example that we are setting above and beyond what we say. Because children will first emulate what they see and then they will hear what you say. And so uh, I think this brings a soberness to the way God looks at how what we do as adults, leaders, mentors, and examples, how it impacts the children. And I would venture to say, even to the point of what we allow them to watch and what we allow them to hear and experience and what we allow them to do 
what dances we allow them to do, what things we 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 uh, let them know is funny um, instead of uh, admonishing them um, because it's not a good look and not a good example. Uh, I think there is a lot to uh, to this, but I found it interesting that he made it a point to talk about, you know, the impact um, of and the gravity by which uh, we lead our lives as an example to the children. Um, he says temptations are inevitable, right? Temptations are inevitable. So there are going to be temptations, but he says what sorrow awaits the person that does the tempting. And I, I, in this case, uh, the temp, the tempting covers more than just setting a bad example. It's leading them astray. It's it's setting a bad example. It's uh, allowing them to do things that are not godly. It's uh, and it could also be preventing them. Uh, from having a relationship with a guy by denying them the opportunity, not answering their questions uh, about who God is and what God is and things like that as well. I think it also uh, covers and emphasizes that point as well. Good, good information. Good information. Amen. And I think it's important that we, that we recognize just for the sake of, sake of stating in case no, nobody really realizes this. We're not just talking about this scenario of natural children, but this is also affected in regards to children of the faith, people are, who are new converts, who are coming new into the faith. For as much as we have to be careful how we conduct ourselves uh, um, in the faces of little children in the physical sense, the spiritual children as well, we have to make sure that we conduct ourselves in the right way so that we don't lead them down the wrong path or, or lead them astray because we have to realize, as, as we said many times in the world, even in the church, that sometimes we as believers, the only Bible that some people will read, we're the only letters that some people will read. And so what does our letter say? What what does our life show? And how does it relate to those people who are coming in new to the faith? And woe unto us if we become a stumbling block for somebody who has just found their salvation, who's just coming into living this life as a believer and our conduct will lead them down the wrong roads or cause them to say, you know what, if this is what the saints are doing, then I might as well go back to my old way. So important to be careful. Amen. I I think that principally, uh, if we understand the principle of the word that he's speaking of, that statement is absolutely true. Um, but but I don't want to diminish the fact that he uses a little child as an example. He pulls a child to him and has the child sit on his lap. And so I, I think the emphasis first and foremost is to the idea of a little child. And then that principle can can be applied to anyone who is looking for leadership and mentorship and guidance, especially in their relationship with God. Um, some of the things that he says is specific to kids like forbid them not to come to me uh, is specifically to little children, not to adults who may uh, be on the journey to come and to have a relationship with him because they, they've matured, they've experienced some things, and, and he, in this case, is referencing those who have not experienced a lot of things, and so they're totally dependent on us as their example. Amen? Amen. Verse 11 says this. Oh, did anybody else want to share before we move forward? I'm sorry. I always want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to share. Praise God. Um, verse 12 says this. It says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hill and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Amen. And so 
we had a, a situation last night where um, we came together and we prayed and Pastor Truth referenced this scripture. Um, but last night it was like the 99 sheep as well as the shepherd went after the one lost one. And praise the Lord, the lost sheep was found safe um, and uh, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. But I think that example is apropos for today. When we look at this example, we, we have to look at it as, as more than just the the shepherd going after the one lost sheep and, and not worrying about the ninety nine. I think it's I think it's much greater than that. That shows the gravity of the passion for the shepherd to the sheep, to each and every one of the sheep. Um, but I think that uh, there is something even more powerful in that um, God says he doesn't want any one of these little ones to perish. Still referencing children, but we can reference it to sheep in reference to uh, the ministry and believers as well. Your thoughts. By the way, if I'm not mistaken, this is the second time that we've seen the parable of the lost sheep in the book of Matthew. I have to go back and see because he went through a whole bunch of parables a couple of chapters back. And I think the lost sheep was one of the parables that he mentioned. And it, I'm, it's, it's like deja vu that I'm reading it again. And I'm saying, well, we, we talked about the parable of the, of the lost sheep before. And now we're talking about it again. So it must be referenced more than once in the book of Matthew. I'm going to have to go back and look at that and see. Amen. Amen. So, I mean, I, 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 I do like what you were saying concerning the parable of the lost sheep. Um, I, I think it really is. Um, I, I think it really shows the zeal. It really teaches us the zeal for the Lord. Uh, that if um, if he's so zealous for us as an individual, that he would leave 99 others to come seek me after what? After one of us. It just shows the zeal concerning each and every one of us as individuals. Um, it doesn't leave anybody out because just like I might be the lost sheep today, you might be the lost sheep tomorrow. He'll still leave the 99 today to come get me and then leave the 99 tomorrow to come get you. It shows God's um, individual love for each and every one of us, even as a collective. Um, and it just expresses the importance of each and every one of us as individuals to God. Um, I, I had an opportunity to just share something in, um, in True Run the other day where I talked about ministry is not a numbers game. We get so caught up in the numbers having a bunch of people that sometimes people get lost in the shuffle and don't get the type of uh, interaction and, and treatment that they feel like they should get from their leader because the leader has stopped focusing on the individual and they begin to focus on the collective and what the collective can do. But God has value in each and every one of us individually as much as he has value in us as a collective. And it just always, it really does speak to the very importance of each and every soul. Not all souls, but each and every soul. And I love that. Amen. 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 Um, I think you make a good point. Uh, I was thinking when you said that um, all of us are sheep, right? Those who are saved and even those who are not saved, we're all sheep. And many of us are lost. And how many of us who are found are going after one sheep? How many of us are, are seeking in the same passion that that is being emphasized in the word by Jesus that he that God doesn't want anyone to perish? How much passion are we using to go after those who are lost? Or are we evaluating um, where they are in their life and whether or not they would be receptive to what it is that the word has to say? Do we have preconceived notions? Do we have issues and things that we are, are contemplating that are key to whether or not 
um, we would even minister to someone because we're already um, judging whether or not they would receive the message. Are we dealing with the issue of um, worrying about rejection versus being so concerned that rejection doesn't matter to us and we're just sharing the good news as God is leading us. I'm, I'm really interested in the passion that we have to go after those who are lost and what we are doing purposefully to make sure that we are sensitive uh, to how God would have us to minister to anybody that we would come into contact with. And that's not to say that we should just go out there and just be uh, sharing the word with everybody indiscriminately. No, God wants us to use wisdom. And that wisdom will help us to make it through uh, each and every situation and circumstance to minister exactly what needs to be ministered in the right timing so that that person can get what they need to move forward. The passion that I'm talking about is the passion to go out and to share the gospel um, and not be deterred and not worry about other people. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it seems, uh, Bishop, that we uh, we do tend to make, I don't want to be general, um, but it seems like it calls for some generalities that we may be making these determinations about people, about where they are. Um, one of the things I, um, I fight against <clears throat> is uh, making up stories about people. Right? You see a person and they are, they are in a particular situation or have on a particular thing or whatever the case may be, and then our minds go there. And that now turns into this roadblock, this, this stumbling block for us not to witness to them in a sense or to provide them with a word or whatever the case may be. Um, so in, in a general sense, I think we... we um, you know, we have to, we should be praying about that, about um, our call to go out and witness, our call to go into the world and preach the gospel, um, and how that that, um, that challenge for us uh, when it comes to people, when it comes to, um, you know, our biases and our uh, judgmentalness that I think we have. Um, again, I, I, I hate being general, uh, but I think it calls for some general, you know, some generalities, uh, because I know for me, I have to, I have to be cognizant of that as well within me and fight against that, um, you know, not saying something to someone because they, you know, or they look a certain way or they, um, they're doing a certain thing. So, um, it's just something I think we need, we, we really are challenged with and we should be praying about. Uh, because again, as is the case, everybody needs to hear about Jesus. And everybody needs to be, um, you know, to be touched at some point. Um, because everyone needs to at least get it from us at some point um, that the Lord is risen, and you know, we are touching them with the gospel. Um, so it's just getting past ourselves and. And, and some of these biases that we may have. Amen. I agree. I agree. The reason why I asked the question is because I had to contemplate about myself. And, and I could think about so many times where, you know, I've let people be a stumbling block to me being, uh, being uh, passionate about sharing the word. And when I mean passionate, I mean that sharing the word was bigger than what I saw or what the situation or circumstance was. And I, I'm just a firm believer that if I had that struggle, then I, I'm not uh, too high minded to think that other people may not have had that same type of struggle as well. And so sometimes the questions that we ask is just to get us to think about things that we we may just take for granted. Um, if somebody didn't share the word uh, to us 
than what we have had the word planted in our hearts, what we have had that word watered over time so that we could have our Damascus Road experience or that that experience that causes caused us to turn away from whatever we were going through and uh, and turn to God. The answer is no, because we can't do it by ourselves. Right. The, the word tells us, you know, how can they hear without a preacher? And we think preacher in this case is just the the pastor or the bishop or the minister or whatever, but he called us a royal priesthood. He gave us authority. He told us to share our testimonies. And so in that way, when we're sharing our testimonies, we become the preacher. We're telling the stories that can change people's lives. And so in that way, um, it, it's very, very important. Uh, I agree. I agree with uh, Heather. She said prejudice can rear its ugly head, which is what many people uh, do. We yeah, we look at and and we develop a prejudice um, based on what we see. And, and that is what causes us not to act. And then she said how we perceive a person can be a stumbling block. I guess what we uh, have to be prepared uh, to do is to reach out to people that don't look like us. We are naturally going to lean towards our comfort zone and speak to who we look like and who we sound like. And that is absolutely correct. Um, it is. What does the song say? Forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him. Well, part of that worship is doing what he's called us to do as well, which is to to speak to everyone because we're all his children. Um it's this world that makes us look at white, black, you know, yellow. Um, we we start to divide things into creed, into color, and we give it some emphasis and some importance. And it has some, um, but that whether or not um, it has some value in reference to us understanding our heritage, where we come from, and some characteristics that we may have. Uh, through our lineage, it does not stop the fact that if you are totally not like me, you still deserve to know Christ and to have the opportunity uh, to to be covered by him, to be accepted by him and to change your life. And, and in that way, what made us different now makes us the same because we're under the same father, the same umbrella. We agree with the same word and we're we're pursuing the same purpose, which is to seek and to save the lost. Amen. 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 I think this is something real quick to like to say this real fast. We have to be careful because we were talking about becoming stumbling blocks. And one of the things that we have to be mindful of as well is not only being a stumbling block to others, but being also a stumbling block to ourselves. Uh, we have this mentality sometimes, especially when you talk about leadership, we've got pastors and bishops and evangelists and so on and so forth. Some people might say that we try to win every soul. And so we might try to cater a message or, or an event or something like that to try to win as many souls as we can. And if we're not careful, we might have done a mighty work for the God, but then we begin to take a tally. I saved 5,000 souls today. And so on and so I'm saying this because I've actually had somebody come into a, a, a room that I was in who, who proclaimed to be an apostle and this, that, and that. And I can't say that he's not. But what he did do is he came in and he began to brag and boast about how many souls he touched and how many lives he saved and how many people he healed and all of these things like that. And I'm like, you're so caught up in yourself and what you've done that, number one, you've forgotten that it's not really you doing but doing this thing, but it's God doing this thing. And then you're so caught up in all of these numbers again. And then sometimes we forget about the one. I, me, myself, I try to approach ministry in this way. I do my best as, as by my big cousin Bishop says, to convey the word of God with the mentality and the understanding that if I even touch one, and I've done my job. The world has this mentality. Uh, instead of uh, running down to get one cow, I'm going to walk down and get a palm and all those things like that. That's a worldly principle. I think sometimes it takes the, 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 the time to just really just make sure that you have your focus on if I can at least touch one. And if it happens to be that I touch one over on the right corner and one over on the left corner, one in the middle and one over on the, the other side and so on and so forth, then in my, my zeal to make sure that I can at least touch somebody, that I touch 
more than what I could what I could have possibly imagined as opposed to having this hardy mentality to try to catch them all like I'm playing Pokemon. And then I miss them all because my high mindedness and my mentality trying to make myself great instead of making God great and try to touch at least a life if I can. Amen. Amen. You know what's interesting about that, and I'm gonna come to you, Pastor Mike. Uh, what's interesting about that is it's amazing that this person, whoever he was, had an accurate count of how many people he touched. He must not have been doing very much work because if you uh, can stand and count each and every person that you touched, <laughs> you're not doing very much work. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Pastor Mike. <laughs> and I love, I love the imagery, too, uh, Pastor Drew, that Pokemon thing. And that's what are the, the misconception? Um, and just hearing this guy, and I think <clears throat> we're not going to beat up on him, but just just hearing the story, you know, it just reminded me that there is this big precon this notion, um, false notion, in fact, that we are saving people. Um, and I always say that you know, like th- that we have individuals who that is their focus, like, I'm going to save such and such, or, you know, like, our, our brother here, you know, I've, I've touched or saved 3,695 and, and a half, right, because I, I saved the baby, too, <laughs> when I kissed him, you know, and it's, and it's, and, and, My and, God, it's, right. <laughs> and it's an absolutely ridiculous thing, we're called to preach the gospel, we're talk, called to give forth the word. And it's God's word that doesn't come back void. It's God who does the saving. And so even for him to make that sort of um, nonsensical um, proclamation shows a misunderstanding and a misconception about who it is that does the saving. Um, It's one of my little pet issues, um, so I'm not going to stand on my high horse. But, you know, it just goes to show you that there is just simply a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding in certain um, individuals because we don't save people. God saves people. Amen. We're just told to be possible. Amen. Listen, the, and, and the, the truth of the matter is that that is why we do what we do here. Um, it's because it's not, it's not us who does the saving. It's not us as the leaders uh, and pastors on this call that the real revelation may come from the the word has an anointing all of its own. And when you engage the word, um, that is when you give it the opportunity to manifest itself. And the more people that you get involved in the process of allowing the spirit to work, the more we can learn, the more perspectives that we can see and and the the greater the word can can resonate with us and make an impact on us in a way that we can use it to our benefit. And so, amen. Uh, I'm blessed to be uh, one of the stewards uh, of of this this format that we use. But um, it, it's the Holy Spirit uh, that does the work. It's the Holy Spirit that brings about the revelation. And, and that's why I invite them in every time. And that's why I am glad that we have ministers and and other pastors that are on this call to keep me accountable to, to what I'm saying as I work to keep them accountable to what they say so that we all make sure we stay on the right track. Amen. 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 Verse, verse 15, uh, Sister Jean says this. If another believer sins against you, Go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything that you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. I want to come back to this two or three witnesses because this is one of the biggest things that uh, is mis quoted and misused in reference to an understanding uh, in the word. And it says, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth. 
whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything, you may ask, my father in heaven will do it for you. I want to stop and go back because I don't want to get too far away from this first point. Um, and this is dealing with how you address disagreements, conflict, uh, and things of that sort in the body of Christ. So it says if, if another believer sins against you, well, sins against you can cause offense, can cause anger, can cause some kind of emotion that will um, cause you to, to uh, be at odds against that person to take offense to what they said or what they did. And what do you do in that standpoint? Let's make it plain. Let's, let's make it plain and let's talk about some practical ways to do this so that we don't uh, stand so sing-songy in the word that we run over these scriptures and we don't give people anything that they can use practically to change their lives for the better. Um, I open it up for anybody to share strategies that you would use if somebody sinned against you and caused you to have offense. That that could be made made you angry, cursed at you, um, lied on you. Uh, it could be anything. Borrow money and never paid you back. Whatever it did, whatever they did against you that caused you to be an offense. What are some of the strategies that you can use to address the issue? And and this is the one thing that I don't want to miss. The word is clearly telling us the first thing that we should do is go privately to that person and let them know that they offended us. Hey, Matt. So let's talk about human nature for a second, if we may. Human nature, when we're upset, when we're offended, we're mad, we're angry, is our instant proclivity to defend ourselves. It's instantly what we want to do is defend ourselves. And so first and foremost, we have to recognize and understand that it's really not our job to defend us when it's all said and done. It's really not our job to defend ourselves. However, we do have the right to voice our opinion. We do have a right to let, inform somebody um, of how they've offended us or upset us. But we should come into it with the right mindset that, that we want to make them aware of what was done so if possible, reconciliation can take place. If you're coming to a person just to offend them because they've offended you, that's the whole wrong way to go about it. And you need to go somewhere and sit down and get yourself together before you come come back to that person and talk to them. But if you have it in your mind, if it's really in your heart that you want to be able to get the situation settled and things of that nature, then you have to make sure you get yourself calm enough to be able to talk to the individual without allowing your offense to control the conversation. A lot of times, that's what we do. We allow our offense to control the conversation, and then we exacerbate the situation because we come into an offensive situation offended and ready to offend. This is the revelation I've received, and I was God to sit down and hush. Um, I was looking into love, and not what love is, but who love is. And I recognize that if my job is to love everybody, if my job is to love everybody, even my enemies, then I have to approach any given situation in the way that love does. And in order for me to do that, I have to recognize who love is and what love is. What do I mean? Love is not your emotions, it's not your feelings, because your feelings can betray you all the time. So who love is, what love is, love is God. So I have to look at God and begin to see how God, or look at how Jesus, in fact, as our example, handle conflict and things of that nature so that I can try to move in the way that love does out of the spirit of God and not out of my emotionality. And I recognize that that's a different concept. I recognize that sometimes it can be difficult because we are emotional creatures. But again, we are supposed to, as believers, walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. So we have to do our best 
to train ourselves to be proactive and not reactive, to act out of love and not out of our feelings and do our best to approach uh, a, a given situation with, with hopes that we can possibly reconcile or come to an understanding to reason together so that God can have his way in any given situation. And I'm closing my mic. Thanks. Amen. Amen. I want to I want to bring in Heather's comments. <clears throat> she referenced Colossians three thirteen through 23, uh, which says, put up with each other, forgive the things that you are holding against one another, forgive just as the Lord forgave you. And uh, overall, uh, and over all of those good things put on love, love holds them all together perfectly as if they were one. Let the peace that Christ gives rule in your heart as part of one body. You were appointed to live in peace and be thankful. Let Christ's word live in you like a rich treasure. Do everything you say, uh, do everything you say or do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Awesome, awesome uh, insight and input. Thank you so much, Heather, for that. And and I want to deal with this human nature uh perspective. Um, one of the things that we have to be very careful of, uh, especially as men and women of God, uh, human nature is a very real thing, but sometimes the word of God is contrary to human nature. And so I can't even look at an answer that God is giving me through the lens of human nature because I've already clouded my perspective and I've already made it humanistic in the way that I'm trying to, to gain understanding. I need to first understand what God is saying, and then I need to convert what God is saying um, to a practical example that gives me the steps that I need to do in order to get through it successfully. Because if I, if I say it's nature, that's my excuse for acting outside of uh, what God may be directing me to do. Here's what I mean. Uh, it says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. So that statement within itself, go to the believer and point out the offense that that has no emotion tied to it. It doesn't indicate anger. It doesn't indicate frustration. It doesn't indicate passion. It just emphasizes going to the other person and letting them know what it is that happened and what your perspective on what happened was. It says do it privately because you are not trying to show them up. You're not trying to embarrass them. You're trying to inform them. So at the very nature of going to someone to talk to them about an offense, it instantly takes out nature emotion, uh, or any bias that you may have in believing that you're right. This is not about being right or wrong. This is about giving information. That's the first thing that I, that I looked at when I saw this scripture. It's, it says strip everything out of it and just go to that person and give them the information. Because if you bring emotion into it, they're going to respond emotionally. Even if you don't bring emotion to it, if they offended you and you're talking to them, they're they're going to probably be on their guard when you approach them in the first place. And so by you stripping away any bias um, or, or anything like that, you minimize the opportunity for them to respond back in a way um, that will emphasize biasness or offense back. Um, you don't put them on guard because you're not saying anything. You're not saying you were wrong when you came to me. The approach is totally different. The approach is, is something like this. Uh, hey, Sally, I, j I just wanted to let you know um, when you did X, Y, and Z, um, it impacted me this way. My perspective on it was this. And uh, I just wanted you to know because I, I don't want anything to come in between um, the relationship that we have or anything to hinder us being able to operate or work together. So before I can have that conversation, I need to deal with some things myself. I, I need to 
I need to forgive them before I even address them. I need to forgive them before I address them. Then I need to put on love as the scriptures indicate before I address them because I have to speak the truth in love, not out of emotion, but out of love. And if I do that, then I put them in a, in a position to be able to receive what I'm saying without being offended. And I may give them an opportunity and the latitude to respond back to me in a way where they may realize that their perspective and my perspective is different. And even if we don't agree, it may give them the opportunity to say, you know what, I respect your perspective. And, you know, I, I didn't mean for uh, you to, uh, to have an offense based on what I said. Um, that's the grounds for gaining an understanding. Amen. Heather says, so true. We have to bring our flesh and desires into subjection. Isaiah 5, 8 and 9 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Heather, you are quickly becoming one of my favorite friends. I love the references that you give. They are so on point. Um, but that's exactly right. We have to put on the character of Christ, which means we have to persecute uh, the flesh and our humanly tendencies. And, and when you speak of us having the right to say something, um, our rights are not supposed to interfere or supersede another person's rights. And so in our right to speak or say whatever it is that we believe, think, uh, or think it is important for us to know that we should not uh, be speaking in a way that would cause other people to be offended or to diminish their thought process. We should look to see what it is that we could do to understand where they're coming from, even if we don't agree with what they said. Uh, your thoughts on that? So I don't know, I, I'm, I may be missing something. I, I, I feel like essentially we're all saying the exact same thing um, because what I, what I was stating in my initial statement is this. In order for us to approach somebody, first we have to deal with ourselves. We have to deal with our emotionality. And as you said, even as Sister Heather has said, we have to subject our emotions to the spirit of God, to the spirit of love. Because once we can subject ourselves and our emotions to the spirit of love, to the spirit of God, and we can focus our mind on doing what God says to do in this situation, uh, then we can approach that person in a way to where we don't come to them in offense. Because the world, the, the world mindset, the fleshly mindset says, hey, I got to get you back for what you've done to me. But the spirit mindset, the spirit of God, when we subject ourselves, it says that a soft answer turns away wrath. And so based on the spirit, we can be led to say, hey, Sadi, this is what happened and this is how this affected me. And I just want you to know so that we can, you know, you know, reconcile this or, or so at least you would know how it affected me, so on and so forth. Because now we've subjected our flesh to the spirit of God and we would approach this individual out of a spirit, uh, out of a spiritual place, out of a godly manner. And we are showing the love of God because that's who God is and what God does. And it shall be our... Um, idea in our mind as scripture says to practice righteousness and even in those places where we're offended we still have the responsibility to practice righteousness yes we have the responsibility and we have the right to let somebody know what is going on so that we can try to have to reconcile so we don't call, call, um, find ourselves in offense um, or any of those things like that so we can rec reconcile it for no other reason than to walk out our faith life as believers to do what the word is just telling us to do, but it's how we approach it that is important. If we approach it, we approach it from the spirit of God and from the love of God, then we can go to him in a peaceful manner and prayerfully we won't have any issues with offense coming back to us. But we have to deal with our fleshly nature first so that spirit can take control and lead us in how we interact with each other. And that's essentially what I was saying. Amen. Amen. I absolutely a hundred percent agree with what you said. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? This is Nolan, and I want to 
kind of elaborate on what was said. So if you don't, if you don't mind, and I, sorry for interrupting the conversation. Go ahead, Nolan. So, yes, uh, there is going to be a, a time, well, yes, I want to kind of say too is that there may be come a time where you may be struggling on God's word and you may not be understanding it. There are some things that God has called you to do. And there may be some things that you may need to ask God for help on. Because even if you don't know why take take uh, why take it behind your back or someone else's back and say, hey, look, what have I done wrong? What have I done if I had to depend from my, if I had to repent from my sins? What have I done wrong that could have been dangerous? Because what it comes down to and what God is calling us to do is to sometimes we have to, we have to ask him for forgiveness if we did some things wrong. Awesome. Because I see, what I see is a problem with some of our clubhouse community friends where they're not understanding and or understanding each other and sometimes in rooms there's a possibility that somebody could get attacked and that's what we don't want that's why God is calling us to help out with solving the situation with them privately that's without right. other people fault. that's right that's right because this is what we don't want and this is what as as a clubhouse community member I take things extremely serious because I do follow what God is asking me and calling me to do because I feel like being involved with you know being involved within the blind community more helping me gives me a chance to build more friendships slash relationships with uh, friend, friendships, I should say, within the blind community here on Clubhouse, as long as I don't cause any drama. Because what God is asking me to do is to step forward and say that, look, you know what you're about to do. You need to do it right. And if you do it wrong, you're going to run you're going to have to suffer the consequences. Amen. Because there, there's, there's a situation there that it could be dangerous. Well, Heather just shared something that I think is pretty interesting. She said, uh, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Second Corinthians 5 and 16 says, Jesus told the Pharisees, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. John 8 and 15 says, we judge people according to how we see ourselves. Uh, that's age, race, appearance, w uh, work, and family. Uh, and so I think she's emphasizing your the, the point that you're making that um, oh, if, absolutely. And I agree with Heather 100% on that. Yep. Yeah. So if we uh, if we are judging people according to um, if we're judging people in the first place, that that is our first challenge, um, because Jesus said he judges. He judged no one. Um, in, in reference to the Pharisees and the perspective that they had. And so even in, in, in with that, in, in our approach as, as to how we approach being offended, um, that tells us that we can't 
be judging the situation as we try to address the offense. Um, Because to judge is to make an assessment to come to a conclusion uh, and then uh, to want to enforce uh, a punishment or to want to enforce uh, the consequence to the behavior. And God is trying to keep us from getting to that point uh, as we address our our fellow brethren in things that may have been offensive to us. Amen. 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 And I, and I love what was said as well because uh, one thing that I believe Nolan did emphasize and things like that sometimes before we address somebody privately concerning how they offended us, we might need to check our own selves to make sure that we didn't do anything to cause the offense and then repent for that so that we might come before them as, as being clean. If you know, if, if you look at the scenario, if you run it back and you see how maybe you might have accidentally bumped them or scuffed their shoe or whatever the case may be and they got angry or upset, then that puts you in a place that when you approach them concerning them cussing you out or whatever the case may be, you can say, hey, listen, I know that I, I might have accidentally scuffed you or bumped you or anything else like that. Not, yeah, I see those look like nice shoes. I apologize if there was any damage that I had done to the shoes and you can begin to talk about that situation to hopefully bring, once again, some clarity into the circumstance to bring some reconciliation. And then in that situation, you might even win a brother based on the way that you approach it with love and finding that common ground and even realizing, hey, I might have done something. While it might not have been intentional, I did something that might have caused offense. And so I'm going to extend, you know, put my best face forward and, and extend this, this olive branch to say, hey, let me apologize for what I might have done first. And then I can address you about how you might have offended me and we can possibly reconcile. So it's always good to check yourself as well and, and your own actions, deeds, and, and, and so on and so forth to make sure that you didn't do anything to cause the offense. So if you go to your brother, you can come to him and you can clear the slate. And that's always a blessing. Amen, amen. That's great stuff. Amen. And I agree with you. And honestly, um, what I am seeing here is there have been times where I, had, where I made a whole bunch of mistakes where I talked about some people behind their backs and this is where I had to come clean and apologize not only to the individual but also talk to God privately and ask him what I needed to do because I knew I was wrong for my actions Amen that's, that's what the word requires us to do so Praise God that he guided you in a way uh, to cause you to to have self-introspection and to see how you could be better so that you weren't put in a position to cause offense to other people. That's that's that shows your your uh, spiritual maturity and your desire to do that which is pleasing to God. It's interesting in this uh, in this story of verse 16, it says, but if you are unsuccessful, So after everything that we just said, there's still another part, because if we attempt to speak to them and attempt to share the information with them and we're unsuccessful in coming to uh, a resolution. And I think the resolution here is an acknowledgement and then uh, an apology uh, if if they can see how they offended you. Uh, If we're unsuccessful in that, it says take one or two others with you. And go back again so that everything that you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So in this case, it's saying the two or three witnesses is to make sure that what you say in an unbiased way, uh, in a non-judgmental way, in a non-offensive way, uh, it that that's seen. And so that the person cannot come back and say, oh, this person offended me, this person uh, came at me in an aggressive way or whatever, that there is a witness to to how you've conducted yourself and how they conducted themselves to, to give you guys an opportunity to work the situation out. And then even further than that, it says, if the person still refuses to listen, then take your case to the church. Now, who's the church? They're, they're not referencing the building here. They're referencing the God people. Is the church, isn't he? No, we are the church. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. That, nothing wrong with that at all. No, we are the church. God is the head of the church, but we are the church. And so 
Um, it says, then if he or she won't accept the church's decision. Now, this is so that uh, it eliminates biasness. The more people who have an opportunity to see and hear the situation gives us the opportunity, if we're operating in the spirit of God, to to bring clarity to both sides so that the situation can be worked out. Um, and if if that person doesn't accept that decision, then it says treat that person as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector. And basically what it's saying is um, step away from that person because they're demonstrating that they're not uh, they're not accepting uh, of uh, of you sharing and trying to work through this process in a way to bring about a resolution. They're not looking to bring about a resolution. They want to stay in the fence. They want to be angry. And so at this point, it's telling you, just like he told the uh, apostles, that if if they went somewhere and, and they prayed and they found that the people did not accept what they said, what did he tell them to do? He said, uh, dust the dust the feet off of, uh, dust the, uh, the dirt off of your feet and, yes, and, and keep it legal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Heather says this, yes, uh, Nolan and at Pastor Truth, we have to lay aside pride and admit our faults. That is a step in bringing a resolution to the situation. I absolutely agree. Um, and so in this case, we've done all that we can do to bring about a resolution and now God is telling us to to dust the dirt off of our feet to to basically to leave them alone, as long as they're in that state and they're not willing to 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 reconcile the situation. Uh, we can't continue to reconcile the situation that they don't want to reconcile. And so at that point, we are to leave them where they are. Now this doesn't mean this doesn't mean to abandon them. I, you know, I may pray for them, but I know I can't interact with them because there is enmity between us. Even if it's not on my end, I'm not going to put myself in a position to cause them to be angry and offended because of my presence. And so it's better for me to step away and let somebody else who they're not offended with be the one that is the, the one that is the steward and who prays for them or, uh, and maybe interacts with them. But as far as I'm concerned, I have to step back from the situation so that I don't cause offense. Um, Verse 18 says, and I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Uh, I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything that you ask my father in heaven, uh, he'll do it for you. And verse 20 says, for where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there amongst them. And so this last part uh, of this scripture, the last three verses that we just covered, really is emphasizing that at this point, we have the power to permit or to uh, not allow what does not represent the kingdom of God and heaven on this earth. And so in part of our stepping away is separating ourselves for, from that, which does not represent Christ's. And, um, he talks about the unity as two or three of us are gathered. Um, that means that if you are the only two or three that are willing to stand for what God stands for, then he'll be in the midst with you. Amen. Um, Heather says this, this is a great, uh, this is great breaking things down like this, Matthew 10 and 14 and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, then depart out of the house or city and shake off the dust on your feet. Thank you so much for that uh, scriptural reference, Heather. Uh, it is exactly correct. Um, and so I just want to, uh, leave us with this thought today cause we're a little bit over. Uh, So this is a great stopping point, but, but I want to leave you with this thought. One of the most important things that these set of scriptures um, hit me with today is the importance of understanding how we approach disagreement, because that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. And even in addressing it, 
it, it's it's a challenge uh, because we want to make sure that we're understood. And I know uh, I, I address the the natural perspective. Uh, and the reason why I address the natural perspective is because uh, I believe that if I leave you with the thought that the first inclination that you have is to rely on what you naturally feel and to to not press towards the position and the mentality that Christ uh, shares with us, then I put you in a position um, to not follow through with what Christ says because you've already succumbed to the natural perspective. And so that was that was the only uh, point that I was trying to make. I, I wanted us to be aware that we understand what human nature is and we can't rely on uh, what human nature takes us through. We have to we have to stable our mind to think on the things uh, that are good, uh, that are sound, that are of a good report. Uh, we have to think on the things that God is telling us um, as in reference to what we should do and how we should should approach things. And so the natural perspective is always going to be there. But that is the thing that we most have to be aware of in order for us to align ourselves with the principle of God. So I absolutely did not disagree with anything that Pastor Truth said, um, but I was only trying to recalibrate our thought process to think about Christ and God and what he says first and not to think first on what our natural reaction would be because our natural reaction would tend to get us in trouble. Amen. Amen. Your thoughts on that? That's just well put, uh, Bishop. Um, I like that, that, that understanding, uh, reinforcing it that um, we have to look internally first to see what was caused. You know, why are we? Ta- why does it did, does it bother us? Why would we take offense? So I, I, it's like that point that we have to first examine ourselves before we you know, forge ahead with finding justice and getting um, reconciliation and, you know, all of this, those things, you know, but, but first looking internally to see what what is going on with us first before looking out, you know, externally as to the offender and the offense and all that stuff. Amen, amen. Heather shared this. She shared a point about uh, ceremonially shaking the dust off of our feet as a testimony against another was understood by the Jews to symbolize a secession of fellowship and a a renunciation of all responsibility for consequences that might follow. That was one. And then Galatians uh, 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. She has a way of finding every scripture to emphasize my point according to the word. I thank you so much, Heather. You cannot miss another session because you uh, helped me uh, so much in giving a scriptural reference for everything that I've said um, that helps uh, empower all of us to to take on Christ first in everything that we do. So I thank you for your contribution today. Um, and anytime you are able to uh, to come in, um, I, I appreciate you so much. She, she said, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. Amen, I, I, I appreciate that. But you are the vessel that he's using today. And so we appreciate you. God bless. Uh, any further thoughts before we uh, before we conclude today? And we'll pick up with uh, verse uh, twenty and twenty one on Sunday to finish out uh, this section, and then we'll move into just talking about the resurrection and what's going on with Christ. Well, no, we'll we'll pick up uh, on Tuesday, 
and we'll get through this and then we'll uh, see how God sets us up for uh, Resurrection Sunday. Hopefully you'll be able to join us because uh, I think it'll be an outstanding conversation in remembrance of everything um, that he's done for us. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless each and every one of you. Um, Pastor Mike, uh, would you do us the honor of praying us out this evening uh, and and just blessing everyone that was able to participate today? It was an awesome, awesome session. And uh, uh, I would appreciate it if you pray us out.